Hi, everyone. I'm Ron Bachman, Senior Director of Programming at WGBH. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We anticipate a very large, large audience, so as people continue to join the event, I want to take a moment to orient you to Zoom webinar, in case you're not familiar with it. During the course of tonight's event, if you have a question, you can pose it in the Q&A tab that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. Just indicate your name and where you're from and type in your question, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. If you see a question that you want to hear an answer to, you can vote for it by clicking the thumbs up icon next to the question to help move it up in the queue. We also have an auto closed captioning feature that you can activate. To turn on the captioning feature, you can click the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen, then select subtitle to enable the captioning, which you'll also see at the bottom of your screen. You can also select full transcript and a sidebar window will open where you can read what each speaker is saying. Just please bear in mind that there might be a slight delay between the speaker's words and the captioning. Now, let's get started. Between 1968 and 1974, WBCN was Boston's groundbreaking rock and roll radio station. It amplified the social, political, and cultural happenings of the time. We are fortunate tonight to have some of the WBCN staff who worked at the station in the late 60s and early 70s. They reflected the countercultural scene, militant anti-war activism, civil rights struggles, and the emerging women's and LGBTQ liberation movements. Before our panel discussion begins, we want to set the stage for you and for this conversation by featuring a segment from the film that captures the essence of WBCN in the late 60s. Enjoy. That first broadcast, March 15th, 1968, I remember Joe Rogers, Mississippi, uh, you know, dropped the needle and played amazing music. And uh, it was a magical time. It was completely free form. It was play whatever we want, bring in records from home. For the first time, there was an outlet for music like this on the radio. This was music of substance. These were artists of interest. These were artists who displayed their roots and their influences. The music was just always important to us. And it was clearly ours. Older people didn't like it didn't understand it. You'd hear uh, Jimi Hendrix, not not uh, necessarily Foxy Lady, you might hear If Six Was Nine, you'd hear a song six deep into the Hendrix album. If the sun reveals the shine. I remember uh, Joe Rogers had brought to the playlist and I started playing one of the earliest known recordings of Aretha Franklin when she was with a gospel choir, a stomping gospel song. Whatever rock was happening, fine. You want to play some folk? No problem. If you wanted to play some Beethoven or some Carl Orff, no problem. Mix it up, throw in some Monty Python, throw in some spoken word. You never knew what you were going to hear on the radio station. Every station would get the records by the Firesign Theater, and it would just take you for a trip. It was literally uh, acidy. You know, it was like acid. Nick Danger, Third Eye. Uh, I want to order a, a pizza to go and no anchovies. No anchovies? You've got the wrong man. I spell my name Danger. What? You'd hear some Muddy, you'd hear some Grateful Dead, you'd hear some Tom Rush, you'd hear a little bit of everything, which is like amazing. Quite simply, you were not going to hear this music anywhere except at WBCN. I remember the absolute shock of hearing long form sets of 30, 40, 50 minutes, and suddenly, we had found on the radio what was the soundtrack of our lives. It's so vivid to me what it was like. Uh, 
you just walk in and, and to a radio station and there'd be all these albums. Uh, you could tell by the color almost of that one edge what artist it was. We would pull these albums out and you know, you'd pull first, you'd pull four or five and say, this is how I'm gonna start my show. And then you'd start getting inspired along the way and you'd say, ah, this song we'll go with. And you'd run up before the record ended and you'd you find that album, you pull it out, you go to the other turntable that was empty and you put the record on, slap it on there, and you cue it up. But if it was in the same key, you'd let it go. And that was the magic moment where you, the two songs would go together. Wah, 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 and then the other song would come up and people would go, oh man, that was great. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce you to my colleague, Henry Santoro. Henry Santoro hosts newscasts on GBH radio and contributes to breaking news coverage and other hosting duties for the station's daytime programming. Henry came to GBH News from Radio BDC, where he served as news director. Prior to that, Henry was a fixture on morning radio as the award-winning news director and morning news anchor for WFNX-FM from 1983 until 2012. Throughout his 30 years as a morning anchor, Henry has delivered coverage of many of the most significant news stories of the era, and he has interviewed hundreds of cultural and political personalities. Henry has a deep connection to local news and community events in Boston, which makes him a perfect moderator for tonight's discussion. Please welcome Henry Santoro to the virtual stage. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ron. Uh, great to see you through Zoom. Hope to see you in the office sometime very soon. And uh, boy, does that bring back memories. And one of the things that Ron uh, didn't mention, and I don't think it's in my bio, is that I got my start at WBCN. Uh, they used to say that uh, if you could work with Charles Lockwoodary, you could work with anybody. And uh, you know what? I worked with Charles Lockwoodary and uh, had a long and, uh, and great career in radio in this town. And, and we have upwards of 700 people, 700 BCN fans who are watching this event tonight. And I just wanna thank you on behalf of all of us at GBH, on behalf of everybody who passed through the doors of WBCN, uh, your ears mean more than you realize. So let's uh, introduce the panel now, my friend, my good friend and, uh, and compadre in radio and, and other things is Charles Lacquadera, very well-known Boston personality, probably one of the most well-known Boston personalities. 1969, he was offered an on-air shift at WBCN to replace disc jockey Peter Wolf. You know who Peter Wolf is, he left to join the Jay Giles band. In 1972, Charles took over the morning shift in BCN and never looked back. The Big Mattress owned this town and stayed at WBCN for almost 25 years before moving on over to ZLX in 1996. Charles was inducted as a member of the Massachusetts Broadcasters Hall of Fame in recognition of his pioneering efforts in FM radio, and he's still doing it. And look at him, look, look at that, look at that mug on that face. He, he looks exactly like he did in, in, that, in, in that film clip. So uh, it's a pleasure to welcome Charles. Next up is Bill Lichtenstein. He, of course, is the, the man behind this movie, uh, the WBCN and the American Revolution, the incredible true story of how a radio station, politics, and rock and roll changed everything. And boy, did it. Uh, Bill is the producer of the film. He began his media career in 1970 at the age of 14. Where else? but at WBCN. First as a volunteer and then at the station's uh, world famous listener line, and then as a newscaster, as well as an announcer. Since 1990, Bill has served as president of Lichtenstein Creative Media, an independent media production company based in Cambridge. He's a Peabody Award winner. Bill and LC Media have been the recipient of more than 60 major broadcast honors. And of course, he writes regularly on media, politics, and health for the Huffington Post, as well as New York Times, The Nation, Newsday, Boston Globe, Village Voice, Entertainment Weekly, and TV Guide. And next up 
is another good friend, my colleague at GBH, Eric Jackson, the host of Eric in the Evening. Nobody knows jazz better than Eric, and he has that voice that you just, it, it's like getting a hug from your father. Eric began his broadcast career in 1969 <laughs> on Boston University's closed circuit AM station, WBTU. And, uh, you know, if you go over the you over the BU Bridge, <laughs> you lose the signal. Uh, in, in the early 70s, Eric hosted a contemporary music show uh, for WBCN. And, uh, boy, if we could see his afro that he had back then, unbelievable. It was out there. Uh, he also produced and hosted Third World Report, a weekly public affairs forum. Eric became a, GBA ho a GBH host in 1977 with Artists in the Night and Overnight Jazz Music Showcase. And then, of course, Eric in the Evening made its debut back in 1981. And Eric has been recognized by the Mass College of Art as one of the 100 most culturally influential Bostonians of the 20th century and by Berklee College of Music for advancing careers in music. And of course, a couple of years ago, we had Eric Jackson Day in Boston, and I made that proclamation to Eric at the Boston Public Library, a highlight of one of my, one of my short career so far here at, at GBH. Uh, last but not least is Debbie Ullman. Uh, much like Michelle Wu, who is now the first female mayor of Boston, Debbie was the first female DJ of WBCN. Uh, she was working at Harvard and at the Boston Tea Party Music Venue in 1968, when she began selling ads for BCN. And then she transitioned from sales to on-air talent in 1970, which is kind of unusual because usually you go from on-air into sales. But Debbie knew where it was at. She knew the music. She, you know, the hell with the sales. I want to play some music. And that's exactly what she did. Uh, Debbie worked at numerous radio stations after leaving Boston. Also spent the past 20 years writing for editing and co-directing Gestalt Press, which is a nonprofit boutique publishing imprint of Taylor and Francis. So with that, you have now met our panelists. And it's time to jump in and let's tell some stories. And Bill, I think we should start with you since, um, you know, since this is your film and, uh, and, and why don't you tell our audience, uh, what made you want to tell this story? Um, it was a story that I've joked about. There was 50 years in the making because when I was working at these things, I was already collecting little pieces of tape and photographs in the way we would all keep up. Uh, a cover of a life magazine and a lot of material that just seemed to have historic importance. And in the mid 2000s, in the wake of 9-11 um, and the Iraq war, there seemed to be a real shortage of people, artists, musicians, activists, uh, speaking up and using their platforms to try to bring about some kind of social change. And I recalled, uh, you know, the era of BCN and how media through BCN, uh, all these artists had really created such an amazing amount of social change, political, cultural change in a short period, and decided to make the film uh, based uh, on that era to tell the story of how media can create social change. There were no archives of the station. There, there were no, you know, uh, right. archives of the tapes. And so all of those came from listeners and people that had them. But, but that's what was the gem of the seed of the idea to do the film. We have, uh, as I said, we have upwards of 700 uh, viewers uh, joining us tonight from really all over the country and uh, other parts of the world as well. They're coming in from England and Italy and France. Uh, they are from all over and uh, I have a laundry list of questions that uh, I think we should get to. I mean, I'll be sprinkling in my own questions as we go, but uh, let's just start right at the top with Alan from Waltham, Massachusetts uh, says that I recall my father listening to Lawrence Welk on BCN in the 1960s when the next song was by the Grateful Dead. This marked the change to the BCN we knew and loved. Was that correct, Charles? I don't know. I don't know that it was Lawrence Welk. I think uh, he might be confused because BCN, you know, meant, uh, stands for Boston Concert Network, and right. and I think. Um, it was kind of a surprise for a lot of classical uh, music lovers to hear 
all of a sudden to hear Jimi Hendrix uh, instead of instead of uh, Shostakovich. So, um, you know, but Lawrence, put it this way, uh, <laughs> put it this way. We definitely would have played. We, we if if I didn't do it, Joe Rogers would have done it. Right. Siegel would have done it. Some, one of us would have definitely played the bubble song with Joe, Lawrence Welk and then went into it. <laughs> so he heard it right. Yeah. I'm just not sure. About and, and, and and we should we should say that 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 WBCN actually started in, in 1958. And that's when it was Boston Concert Network. And it was re, it was a classical station. And then it was in in March of, of 68 that. Uh, all hell broke loose, and and I feel free uh, came on the radio, and and BCN really never never looked back. Uh, Debbie, what were those days like for you? Well, the first thing I want to point out is that the introduction underestimates the role of WBCN. I'm identified as the first woman announcer on WBCN. Big, who who cares? Well, you know what? But what? It was, was WBCN was the first station on the East Coast of the United States that put a woman in, in a major market into morning drive. That's, yeah. that's how I want to be identified as <laughs> the person who was lucky enough to be there when the decision was made to put a woman into morning drive on BCN. And of course, it was after the women stepped back and let Charles move in with the big mattress that the ratings went through the roof. But nonetheless, as I was a folkie, I was uh, definitely a Cambridge folkie and had grown up on the Cape listening to bluegrass music, especially and acoustic blues. And, you know, my world of music expanded enormously when I started listening to BCN and then working at the uh, Boston Tea Party as a coat check person. Uh, yeah. And then I got to know everybody. But um, yeah, uh, it was, phew, it was so much fun. It really, and I was also an activist, still am. And, yeah. uh, and I was noticing when we were doing our sound checks that when we say blah, blah, blah now, we <laughs> had Thunberg reminding us not to blah, 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 but to do something. But to, yeah. Yeah, so anyway. If you, those, it, right, if you, if, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything, right? There you go. Very nice. <laughs> and, and Eric, before you brought the jazz, you brought the funk to BCN. Uh, what was that yeah. like? First of all, I want to say I, I'm sure someone knows. Uh, maybe, maybe in fact, uh, Ron Delacchiesa knows exactly what that segue was that went from the classical to the jazz, since Ron was the program director of right. the classical station. Um, and I know because I know I've heard what the two songs were, so um, it is known. But I, I'm pretty sure it was not Lawrence Wilk. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> do you but, do do you remember the first song you played? Actually, no, I don't. No, no, no. no. But I do. I do. Uh, I did like the idea that this station was allowing me uh, the freedom to mix things together. I was given a kind of different assignment than what the uh, uh, most of the announcers were given. I was hired, and when they hired me, the program director, Norm Weiner, asked me to do a 60% jazz show. This is close to an exact quote, a 60% jazz show with a heavy emphasis on other forms of black music, but play some white music too. That's close to an exact <laughs> quote of what he uh, said to me. So um, there were some both in-house and out of the station, I, I'll say outhouse, uh, yeah. who did like to hear, uh, uh, who did like um, my presence at the station because of that, they, they wanted, pure rock and roll but but for me it was it was great and I, I thought it was great for Boston to have a station that could play what in some cases a lot of times I called adult uh, uh, black music there were a lot of you didn't have any you know you could play artists that uh, people who are a little bit older would want right. to listen to you know right uh, you know it's funny because uh, BCN 
um, was not just the, the number one station in Boston. To us, BCN was the number one station in the world and everybody knew it. Everybody was keyed into it. And it was the music that was the springboard. But as Bill points out in the film, the, the activism in the politics and the role that BCN played in ending the Vietnam War is so much bigger than I think most people realize. And that is a key reason for someone to see the film because everybody was on board. There was nobody that was that 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 turned their back on on what was going on. It, it, you know, you guys were, were were really the first responders. You were running into the fire. And Bill, uh, tell us how you captured that with this film. Um, I looked at that period and specifically how the '60s um, evolved from being kind of peace, love, and LSD, and the summer of love in the '60s. Uh, in San Francisco to uh, by 1960, that was the summer of 67, by 68, uh, it, the, the center of the counterculture arguably had moved to Boston uh, because there were hundreds of thousands of college students here. The draft was looming over everybody's head. People were being sent off to Vietnam. And the anti-draft movement really was, was strongest at that point in Boston, Dr. Spock, and a lot of resistance to the draft. Um, and BCN really threw its whole weight behind the anti-draft movement. Early on, uh, it was clear that the issue of free expression, which permeates the film, uh, you know, had also been sort of a central mission and theme of WBCN. Um, but uh, it wasn't clear to me why, even having worked there. And I asked Joe Rogers, who was one of the original announcers, and he said, look, he said, with the draft going on, we felt like if we could speak up and say what was on our mind and speak back, that would empower other people to do the same thing. And right. so really, there was this kind of uh, synergy of the music, the politics, the anti-draft music, uh, a movement with BCN in the middle of it, surrounded by these hundreds of thousands of college kids that was its own special uh, kind of cauldron that cooked up a lot of what became the 60s. And I think uh, arguably, you know, was critically important, and also a story that really hadn't been fully told, uh, you know, until this point. Let me, you know, it's funny because uh, me being the the crazy, uh, you know, news guy and rock and roll news guy that I am, uh, I couldn't help uh, but think, and I think of this often: uh, How would BCN of the American Revolution days have handled? something like the January 6th insurrection on the Capitol. Um, ha have you even thought of uh, that approach uh, or what BCN would have done if, if all the, these thousands of people stormed the Capitol? Uh, Debbie, you look like you might have a comment on that. Well, I mean, we were the upstarts at that point. We were, we were pushing, but we were still in the thrall of nonviolent confrontation. Uh, in 68, of course, Martin Luther King was assassinated, but um, we were by and large nonviolent. Uh, I don't think you can juxtapose 1968 to, to 2021. It's just, right. yeah. yeah. It, it's just that so many things ha have shifted in the broader culture and um, it, it, kind of sad. I'd actually like to hear from Charles because he actually bridged from back <laughs> then up to into the uh, 2000s um, and was paying attention. I expect that. Well, he, 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 he is that. still paying attention. If you follow Charles on Facebook or Twitter, yeah, uh, exactly. you'll know that he is still very active in his activism. And what Charles, what are your thoughts? Well, <clears throat> you know, I, I've got some 30, I don't know, I don't know how many thousand <clears throat> followers, what, what Facebook calls followers. <clears throat> and um, they're half of them, what, what, or it, probably half of them now are Trump people, are, are conservatives. Yeah. And, and what happened, the, the, the January 6th thing, yeah, I think, Henry, when you asked, like, what, what, would, what would BCN have done now? Well, if I were on the radio now 
and that insurrection happened <clears throat> in um, uh, in January, I would have it would have it would have been us against them because to, and, and, and the audience changed. It's like um, a lot of the audience who were part of WBCM. Uh, listening to WBC and making requests and and part of that movement, they changed. They became, and when I say they, I don't mean to separate uh, people, but that's exactly what happened. They just, uh, they became uh, the people who were followed Trump and who were people who were uh, thinking that they are the, the, the 1776, these people you know, in January 6th think of themselves as the, the patriots of, of the, the old days of the 1770s, right. and they weren't. And BCN, if I were on BCN, it would be us against them. And, we'd, and I'd be saying, you know, I'd be saying, I wish the heck it was us. <laughs> going there, taking over the Capitol when Trump was in, was in charge. But, you know, it, it changes back and forth. It goes back and forth. And, and you also wanted to say something about Debbie and Morning Radio. Oh. Charles. Yeah, Charles. When, when Debbie was talking about the morning radio thing and, and me taking over, how that happened was pretty bizarre because, Debbie, you had... You had gone on to other things. Dinah Vaporn was on was was mornings, and um, we were having a, a WBCN meeting, you know, of the disc jockeys every Friday. And um, Dinah, at one point, she raised her hand and said, "Why the f are women? Why do women get the crazy shift? Because at the time." <laughs> At the time, most people were listening to BCN at night. They were stirring their rice. They were having communal uh, things going on. And BCN was had many more listeners later, you know, after six o'clock than they did in the morning. And so Diana said, how come women always get the crap shifts, you know? And, and I said, and I was in the back of the room and I said, Diana. There's no such thing as a crap shift on WBCN. So Dinah said, well, you take mornings, Effer. <laughs> you know, I was like, all right, I will. And then after that meeting, I, I you know, uh, Norm Weiner said to me, the program director said to me, you realize what you just did? And I said, yeah, what did I just do? I'm, I'm going to end up doing mornings. And it was like, yeah, I had to figure out something to do with the mornings. And so we decided that, you know, we'd have to have a name for it. We wanted to make fun of AM radio and Woo Woo Ginsburg and what the AM radio stations were doing, you know, the top 40 guys. And so we just did a, uh, a thing of making fun of morning radio and it was right. a, a lampoon of morning radio and we needed a name for it. And we figured, well, people are waking up in all different parts of New England. So somebody in Arlington's waking up saying, good morning to Concord, New Hampshire. Good morning uh, to Lexington. Good morning. And it was like the big mattress we called it the big mattress so that was the name of the show and and you know we just hoped that it would work and eventually it just caught on so it worked out pretty well it really did and and, and charles you were among the the first in the country to have an ensemble cast working with you yeah um i liked i i kind of left my the, the station open to everybody so um a lot of times people would come in, everybody wanted to work on the listen line. People, like you said, with BCM was so popular um, that people wanted to come in and just be there and, and be interns. And so a lot of those interns, uh, you know, like I'd be sitting there trying to think of what, what the Red Sox did and I couldn't remember the name of the pitcher. And one of the interns, his name was Paul Sferuza. He came in, this big guy, burly guy, was a taxi driver and a baker. And he came in and he said, and he told me what was going on with the Red Sox. So I said, hey, why don't you be the sports guy? And you're a big guy. <laughs> let's call you the round man. No, no, let's call you Tank. We'll call you Tank. And so that's how Tank became the, the sports director. And, and uh, somebody else came in and they were, uh, somebody said, hey, there's this guy that does real great impressions of, um, of uh, uh, the Star Trek people. Uh, you should call him up sometime. And so I called the guy up and, and his name was Billy West. And Billy West uh, did more than just Star Trek impressions. Billy West, uh, uh, who people now know as the voice of uh, 
uh, uh, Rocky and, uh, you know, all those different... Uh, Every, well, Ren and Stimpy and Doug and... Uh, Rocky, the, the squirrel, the, the cereal yep. squirrel, and the, I think he's the purple M&M. So, so Billy West became, you know, uh, part of my show. Eddie Gordetsky, who um, produces all most of the shows you see on TV now, you see at the end, produced by Eddie Gordetsky. He came in. Oh, yeah, uh, well, Two and a Half Men, and uh, Will yeah, and Grace, yeah. yeah. Yeah, David Bieber can't call me one day, and he said, there's a guy that over at the Rainbow Rib Room across the street from at, at the corner of Mass Ave and Boylston, and there's a short order cook that's funny as hell. You should get him on the show. So we brought Eddie Gordetsky in, and he became part of the whole Dwayne Glasscock uh, uh, <laughs> extravaganza and also he supplied me with you know all of the stuff that people give me credit for uh has very little to do with me it really has to do with the <laughs> fact the fact that all i did was echo what all these writers would give me eddie gordeski and i'd press a button if i got stuck for something i would press a button and billy west would come on and, and or eddie gordeski or uh, Lance Norris. So, so many different people were part yes. of a great writing team. Julie uh, Brummer. I mean, I had, a, I was incredibly lucky to have, a, I, I considered myself sort of like JFK. I wasn't that knowledgeable about stuff, but I surrounded myself with a lot of people that were, and uh, I got lucky. And you had a great gift to gab, as we're seeing right now. <laughs> uh, we're going to, we're, we're going to, we're, we're going to pause just for a second. Uh, my colleague, Sandy Chin, is uh, going to do a quick pitch, and we're going to come right back, and we're going to jump right back in, talk more about BC, the early days of BCN, and uh, we got a lot of questions to get to. So let's, let's go to Sandy right now, and then we'll come right back. Hello, everyone. I'm Sandy Chin with GBH's <clears throat> Member Engagement Department. Thanks for spending time with us to learn so much more about WBCN's roots in the late 60s and early 70s. GBH remains committed to celebrating Boston's unique history and culture. We're proud to present some of WBCN's rich history with you, but need your support to provide free virtual events like this one to our diverse audiences. And tonight, when you show your support by making a one-time donation of $90 or by giving $7.50 a month as a GBH sustainer, we'll send you WBCN and the American Revolution how a radio station defined politics, counterculture, and rock and roll. This brand new hardcover book will be sent to you when it hits the shelves later this month. Its 304 pages contain a collection of concert posters, news clippings, photographs of iconic musicians, and historical scenes around Boston. And tonight there are three ways to give. Visit gbh.org slash support events, text GBH, to 800-204-3811 using keyword GBH to donate, or scan the QR code here to open the donation form on your smartphone. You can give $5 a month as a GBH sustainer or one-time gift, whatever works for your budget. And giving to GBH takes just a few minutes of your time and a few dollars on your credit card. And since we make the process quick and easy, those few minutes now will become hundreds of hours of informative cultural programs and smart entertainment. Really, it might be the best use of your time today. If you're already a GBH member, thanks for your support. If you wish to become one tonight, just click on the support link in the Zoom chat or text GBH to 800-204-3811 or scan the QR code. It's that easy to make a donation. Thanks, everyone, for your interest in WBCN and GBH. And now back to you, Henry. Thanks so much, Sandy. Uh, it's such a great, it's such a great cause. I mean, we we love your donations to GBH. We love your recognition of of WBCN. And uh, we're back now with Charles Lacordaire, Bill Lichtenstein, Eric Jackson, Debbie Ullman. Once again, I'm Henry Santoro, news anchor and host here at GBH. And if you listen this morning from 5 a.m. to 10, you heard me doing Morning Edition. I'll be there again tomorrow. Uh, let's jump back in with uh, some questions. Um, uh, Jeffrey from Boston uh, asks, how do you see the inter intersection of music and politics during the 60s and 70s? And he says, did BCN or its DJs feel some obligation or desire 
to advocate for a certain issue? I mean, did were there individual causes that 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 the jocks wanted to bring to the table? I don't think there's any question that uh, Richard Nixon represented to us what Donald Trump has represented during his presidency to those who were opposed to his politics, which was we've got to do what we can to get rid of Nixon, and that he was tied to globally so much that was wrong with the country at that point, including this illegal and fair war in Vietnam. But uh, yeah, no, I think we all saw our role in radio as as having a responsibility and an opportunity to make the world a better place. And how can we use the radio station and the music, which in turn was being produced by musicians who had the same belief? How do I use my music, my voice? Uh, so there was this kind of gestalt of everybody trying to improve the world through their music. You know, and DCN was kind of at the hub uh, of the whole thing. Uh, and, and because it was before social media and cell phones, and it became the, the go-to place for everybody to find out what was going on and to get music. To, um, so it, it had a special kind of role that way. Right. Um, David from uh, Maine wants to know, uh, can you talk about BCN's eventual change from a progressive freeform radio station as depicted in, in the movie um, mm -hmm. to a more structured commercial format? And I think Charles, you were the one who, who went through that transition. Yeah, when it first started, as you, as you saw from the opening uh, movie of uh, uh, Joe Rogers and Tommy Hedges, um, you know, talking about and Norm Weiner talking about uh, how we could play anything we wanted. The problem was that that um, it, I think there's a there's an adage that I'm not sure is true or not, but but I like to uh, think it is that you can have great radio. But you also, if you want great radio, you're going to have lousy ratings. And if you're right. going to have lousy ratings, you're going to have great radio. <laughs> because people going to work, they really, they don't want to hear a long John Lee Hooker song that goes on for 20 minutes. You know, they want to hear the Eagles. They want to hear, uh, you know, groups that you too. They want to hear groups that they're familiar with so they can tap their toes to the, to the sound and tap, you know, tap the steering wheel while they're on their way to work. So I think that that the, the suits came in who bought BCN realized that. And I, I said to Mel Carmazan, who was one of the big honcho who sort of eventually took over all the radio stations that uh, of Westinghouse and stuff. And we were sitting over lunch one time and I said to him, Mel, you realize by, by constricting us like this, you're screwing up, you're, you're ruining radio and what radio stands for. He, he looked at me and he said, if I don't do it, somebody else will. He said, you know, you want me to just step down right now? Yeah. He said, I will. And I'll go off and play golf and someone else will come in and they'll do what has to be done because the job of a CEO is to get ratings and get money for the company. And be, people who have our stock in Infinity or Metro Media, whatever it was called, these people want money. And so it all got down to money and you made money by playing the same songs over and over now bcn didn't really go totally down the tubes uh like uh like a lot of other stations did um we had people come in like tony veradini and oedipus who started off as djs so they kind of knew what yeah. was going on musically and so when they when they got orders from the top like you got to get us ratings you got to start getting commercial you got to start playing more hit songs. They would do that, but they did it slowly and they intermingled. So, you know, we would, I would still be able to, up until almost the very end, I was still able to play, you know, songs that were nobody ever heard of going six deep into a Hendrix album or playing, you know, a, a U2 song that most people who didn't buy the album didn't know about. And, and you know, and also they let us mix a spoken word in so we still could get you know have that kind of a mix of spoken word uh, like fireside theater or uh what was that thing from um uh, was it full metal jacket where robert yeah. DeVall says smell that that's the smell you know you play that and then you 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 play a door song or you play a uh uh you know a a, a beatles song some song that would would tie what he said 
together with it. So you could do stuff in radio that is not done today. And, and radio at that time, you could, you could just sit there and listen to the station. You would hear, like if we were doing radio now and it was BCN at its highest, it would be Donald Trump saying something and then maybe something fire sign theater, some clown uh, go, would, would go, you know, oh, that was really stupid. And then, and then you'd go into some music to say something, how, Bob Dylan, how does it feel? You don't know what's happening, Mr. Jones. And there'd be all of this stuff going on audio wise that would just take you uh, somewhere. But yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 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 and tie that into the, to the film itself because that's what's so exciting about what Bill has pulled off with this film is that he's tell he weaves in for people who haven't seen it yet he weaves in these urgent issues that were happening on the streets and and the music that we were playing and as Charles describes the process of putting it together there was so much spontaneity and heartful engagement and we were all activists we were all involved in what was going on in the street and we had the audience with us our audience was we with did, us. exactly that's and, that's the other and 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 if i could just interject it was also a very important time for protest songs we don't have protest songs today like like we had back in the in the late 60s well, and and that's where the bcn news department came in because you took a guy uh, who, who Bill highlights tremendously in the film, Danny Schechter, the news dissector. And Danny was the guy who would do his, his uh, you know, really biting news commentary and weave in those protest songs, uh, creating a type of radio that, that hasn't, been, has, hasn't been done since. One thing Danny showed that I think is really important to legacy is that, uh, you know, people remark these days, isn't it interesting that oftentimes they'll say the most credible journalist in America is in fact a comedian like John uh, Stewart or Stephen Cole. How could that be? Danny showed that by taking news, which before BCN was serious and, and dry and, and this idea to be objective, you didn't want to color one way or the other, and that by adding music and comedy and making it entertaining and putting it in context, really, that it was more credible and more clear. Um, and, and then bringing people in like Noam Chomsky and Howard Zinn to comment. And I think you can draw a, a direct line from what BCN and Danny would do with the news uh, uh, to, you know, the, to the Daily Show and Weekend Update and these programs where when you watch it, you go, I'm getting more news and more honest news you know, from Saturday Night Live than I am from, from the CBS Morning News. Uh, and Danny really had that vision and I think is responsible for sort of creating that approach to news, which is, is really very powerful. Yeah. Eric, what was your role in, in all of this, this activism that with BCN was, was, was leading the charge on? Well, I think in, in uh, one sense, because of the unique uh, uh, blend that I was supposed to bring to the station, I think the station was aware that I was going to reach a different audience. Uh, but I, I still was trying to deal with the same kind of ideas that uh, uh, BCN was dealing with. I've often spoken about there were two, uh, two important things going on. Uh, for young black folks, there was many of them were certainly aware of the so-called counterculture, but they were also aware aware of what was going on in the black community. And so, with my program, when I was play, programming music, I was aware of that both those things were ha happening, and the music that I was playing was trying to speak to uh, uh, both those group of people. So. Um, I, I think that's where I would place myself in my show in that mix. I wish I'd been you know, in Boston then, Eric. I, what'd you I, say? I wish I had been in Boston. I had left town, but I no. never got to hear that mix. However, I have been a fan of your 
jazz program, which has also been broad and integrative uh, right. for decades now. But I did, never heard your BCN show. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh. Sounds like I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find some of the tapes too myself actually. <laughs> <laughs> but you but you know you know what else and and Charles kind of touched on this without saying it is that the BCN disc jockeys listened to BCN. Oh yeah. You know, you take a guy like uh like like Matt Siegel, Matty in the morning over at, at Kiss 108 across town who actually, you know, did a stint at at at, at did middays. Uh, on BCN back to back back when he was starting out, um, Maddie's not going to listen to Kiss. He's not going to get in his car and tune and on the, you know when his show is over and listen to Kiss. But the BCN jocks listen to BCN. Oh sure. You guys were listeners, not just not just you know employees. Yeah. Yeah, some of us didn't have FM in our cars. I drove old cars. <laughs> huh. Yeah, but you know what, Debbie? Well, I didn't, you didn't have a car for years. So. Right. You didn't need it. All you had to do was walk down Newbury Street on a hot yeah. summer day. That's right. And you could hear BCN from one end of the street to the other because everybody's windows were open and everybody was tuning into 104.1. Not, not, not just Newbury Street. Still, you, could, right? you, could go from, you could go from downtown Boston all, at Filene's all the way to Cambridge and you hear BCN from store windows and dormitory windows. <laughs> um, one of the things I wanted to bring up here is I'm looking at the questions here from people. And um, this uh, Debbie... There's two women that uh, Agnes B says, I think Debbie wanted to tell about the first song she played. Please bring that up. I, I saw it in her body language. And then uh, MDM group attorney mediator said she was cut off and acknowledged uh, and not acknowledged something often done to women. Debbie, <laughs> did you really want to say what song your first song was? My first song, I got really excited when Henry asked that and hoped he would ask me. So uh, good on you uh, who read my body language. Um, it was Little Richard. And it was, I was called in from the sales office when they were gonna have an air staff meeting in the uh, production studio. And uh, they said, if you can learn the board in 10 minutes, you're on at three o'clock. <laughs> so that's how I got initiated. Um, so anyway, I put on um, uh, Little Richard. Uh, oh, I was, oh dear, what? Uh, no, I'm not gonna be able to, not function at the junction. That's not quite it, but there's a line like that. Um, anyway, yeah, it was a celebratory Little Richard song. So, and um, yeah, yeah, it was quite, quite well described by Charles how much fun it was to have an idea, put it on, and then think what else to play next and see right. if they work yes. right. Oh, the and also, yeah. also the, um, the, difference, uh, the difference between having records, uh, those vinyl things, those round vinyl things, for those of you who are under 30 who are watching this, having vinyl records, we had three turntables. Right. And, and, and we also, each turntable had three speeds. So 33, 45, and actually we had, our turntables had 78 speed for the old, old records. And, uh, you know, and, and you could do, you could do what, what we call segues. Uh, you could, oh, you yeah. could play as one song was ending and you can't do it with CDs because a CD, you know, it'll end like this. The last note will play bong and then somebody will go, and then it'll cut off. You'll hear part of an applause. It, there, it was no fading but you could actually fade one song into another. It was, it was really magical. And um, they, they just, you know, radio stations today, you just can't do the same. The people who saw BCN and who experienced BCN, um, you people who were actually part of it and heard it, it'll never happen again. It'll yeah. never happen again. So you're as special, more special actually than, than we are. We just sort of, we, you know, the musicians made the songs and then we took credit for playing the songs that we didn't make. And now you people who listen to BCN, you are the people who are just the luckiest people in the world because it'll never happen again, not to your children or grandchildren. It was a, a very special time 
um, in, in American history and Boston history. Uh, Peter from, from Newport, uh, Deb, you, you, no, were you going to say something? To, Peter well, from Newport wants to, go ahead, Deb. <laughs> Uh, I'm just thinking that the important thing about the film is that it reminds us that that collective consciousness had the effect of ending the, the war. I mean, other things, obviously, but had a huge impact. And right now, the world is in a precarious moment where we need the kind of collective consciousness spirited by fun but engaging with other people across our differences. And we need it desperately right now. So I just needed to get off on that little soapbox for a second to say, no, we'll never do BCN again, like what we did, but some things are happening in the streets right now that are collective and are meaningful. And I think we need to support them. Yeah, well, BCN was the voice. I mean, BCN, if there was something happening you you know you you would hear about it on BCN and 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 BCN was a great motivator of of people, um, you know, to get out and protest the Vietnam War, to protest Harvard's involvement in the Vietnam War. Um, you know, when BCN said we're you know we're going to rally in the common, a hundred thousand people would show up, and that's the book. film. You know, sure. that's what the yeah. film is about. That the film, that film, uh, th this film for, for again for those like Deb said, if, if you haven't seen it, you really got to experience the movie because you won't see anything like it. And and it really is how rock and roll and and politics uh, of of a radio station changed, uh, you know, changed well, the course of history. And it really well, did. And, it, and and it was BCN. It's a it's a history lesson for those people who lived the time. And it's certainly a history lesson for people who didn't live that time. That, that's right. what and I thought in, when I saw and, the and, film. And I was up there. And, and up until <laughs> now, education. yeah, up until now, it wasn't available in any book, but now we've got right. the companion book coming out to the film. And finally, it is, you know, between the covers of, of you know, of a, of a book at, where you can really see and, and vision, uh, visualize what was going on. Um, speaking of which, uh, Al from uh, Walpole wants to know if any of you uh, participated in any on-air shenanigans that caused the station or yourselves to be levied a fine by the FCC. <laughs> 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 no, but I think all of us, I don't know if all of us, but, but it was pretty common at BCN because the, the person who started the station, Ray Reapin, had a very limited management toolkit. Basically, the only thing he had in his toolkit was to fire you and then hire you back the next day. So I, I was fired at one point for, for being in, in the production room while somebody was smoking a joint and then hired back soon after. I know Charles was fired numerous times. Uh, so. We incurred the wrath of Ray Reap, and I don't think the FCC filtered down to the level of individual announcers, but Ray talks on the phone about having to go down to Washington and sit there and get dressed down by the FCC about you know, what kind of a, a deal was running up there because people would write to the FCC and complain about uh, a myriad of things that BCN intentionally, I, I think, uh, I I'd like to ask everybody because you know it, it, it resonates when he says it, in the film, Joe Rogers says, we knew all the rules in broadcasting and, and we did what we could not to follow the rules. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I think to some extent, you know, we did, Charles talks about how we played the songs with the F word in it. And, um, you know, I think there was a clear sense of not just going up to the line, but crossing it just as a way to make a statement about, uh, you know, what the federal government was doing in Vietnam. It was all connected. Don't forget the um, the the, the uh, John Lennon song was uh, BCN actually put that FCC to the test because the FCC, you know, um, they didn't want gratuitous uh, swearing or or, or 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 bad words. So what uh, I, I forget who the program director was at the time, but we played John Lennon's "Working Class Hero" with a total f bomb in it, very very loud, very clear, and we played it over and over. Um, and dared the FCC to, you know, to, to uh, uh, you know, uh, challenge our license, but they never did. But they did 
they did come get involved, Bill, at one point, because when I first started at the WBC and I was like the oldest guy, I remember going to a party uh, back when Boston, uh, along the waterfront, there were all these, there weren't all these great buildings. There were just these old uh, artists, uh, lofts, and they would have parties up there and everybody would be smoking joints and stuff. And I remember when I first started at BCN as the oldest person, um, somebody came up to me and said, Charles, they're talking about you in the corner. And I said, what are they saying? Well, they're saying, why has Charles Lacroix is 30 years old and he hasn't made it yet. So what I did was I went back to the station the next day and I, I took white out on my license, on my FCC license. Oh, I remember changed, that. I changed the date <laughs> to make me like 20 years younger. Yes. And I guess yes. Yeah, when the FCC came in, I guess they did a regular checkup. They uh, they uh, threatened us with a fine if I didn't fix it. So they fixed it. So I, I almost got in trouble. We almost, we almost well, the FCC story. Of course, we have to go to the fabulous live broadcasts that Sam Copper um, recorded, like from live, from no the, delay, live, no delay. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and of course, in the film, you do see some of Patty Smith live from uh was that paul's mall or Jeff? paul's mall yeah, yeah patty yeah. please don't swear patty please don't you once you said that to her you knew she was going to do it right but right. Th things you see right now that are so common in radio and television man woman on the street interviews it wasn't done you know radio before bcn or top 40 or the bbc or you know uh, uh you know was very controlled radio i came into the the office one morning and sam copper was on the air morning show he says, come with me. They, they were throwing a mic cable out the third floor window. And we went downstairs onto Stewart Street with a live microphone, no delay. And I had a sign that said, do not swear you're on the air. <laughs> and then we were people on the street asking, you know, where are you going? What do you got to do today? How's everything going? You know, and so it sounds very pedestrian by today's standards, but, you know, it hadn't been done. Radio stations right. didn't go out onto a street with a live mic. Uh, you know, uh, for the public just to come in and speak their <laughs> mind, but that was sort of the, the essence of, of BCN, you know. Yeah. Uh, Bill, where it, it, I, my memory is jog. Is is Don Lon not, it, did he not make the film? Don Lon is a, the photo of Don Lon, the film of uh, pictures of Ray Weepin and in the beginning is a picture from Don Law was, was was what was the club owner. He owned he owned the tea party. No, he was the manager. Ray Reapin owned the tea party. Oh right. Oh that's right. That's, that's right. That's right. That's right. Steve Nelson. And then Steve Nelson was there and then left and then Don Law came along. Uh we interviewed Steve Nelson for the film. We offered Don the chance to be interviewed and decided not to. Uh but but they sort of served a similar function at the the tea party, although Don went on to become you know a great uh successful live leader, nation. Successful. Mm. uh promoter but but they were both there sort of in the early days of the tea party um you know and steve uh, sort of serves a really important function in the film to go back before bcn and how it right. all kind of he was there you know before the station and, and its arrival at the tea party we uh we just have a, a couple minutes left here but i wanted to get this in uh, it's a question that each of you can respond to pretty quickly uh what is your single favorite memory of your earliest days on air let's start with you debbie oh no <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay there was one time when um i, I ran out of dog food i lived in weymouth and I had to feed my dog um, peanut butter. And, um, and she started roaring at me and making this because she couldn't open her mouth. And anyway, I'm just remembering that when I got to the studio, I told people the story and I got a lot of friendly dog calls sympathizing with the experience of running out of dog food. I mean, I can't believe I'm going with that instead of the Holy Modal Rounders or, <laughs> or uh, Dave Van Ronk actually coming in to make a guest appearance and bringing 10 or 15 people with him and taking over at the mic. Anyway, lots of good times. Eric? Uh, I remember uh, one night being on the air and I got this phone call and the person said to me, I'm gonna commit suicide. Oh. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. You know, I'm figuring, well, they called me. Let me try and 
talk with them for a few minutes and get them get them to call some appropriate organization. So we're talking, and uh, you know, I I come up with the well, there must be something you can do other than commit suicide, and she said, oh, and what do you suggest? And I said, oh, no. <laughs> I, I said, well, maybe you should call somebody else. <laughs> you know? It was like, I, I think I just stepped in something here, right? <laughs> you know? Wow. And, and, uh, and you, Mr. Laquadera, well, my, it's a, the, a magic moment for you. Well, this would uh, probably be after... Uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is after Bill, uh, Bill's movie, uh, when we got a little bit later into WBC and when I had concocted uh, uh, this uh, uh, character that I, I, I pretended to be uh, on Saturdays. It was a character and we called him Dwayne Glasscock. And so I remember Dwayne Glasscock uh, being on the, on the air and um, I like to, to refer to him as Dwayne and not say me, because I really wanted to separate myself from Dwayne. But on Saturdays, uh, I sort of became Jekyll and Hyde, I became Dwayne Glasscock. Anyway, one Saturday, Dwayne Glasscock went on the radio and started saying that um, the ratings had come in and, and the ratings were really great for BCM. The announcers, I think, uh, got like a four or a f number four or number five, which is a fantastic rating, at least it was at the time. And Dwayne Glasscock was getting, every Saturday for his show, he was getting 13s. So <laughs> Dwayne goes on the radio and he says, you know, um, and I can't do the Dwayne voice very well, but something like, uh, uh, hello, Rangoon, there's all these fat guys smoking cigars, driving big black Cadillacs down in, in, in Beltsville, Maryland. They call themselves Arbitron Research Bureau. They were like a rating company that gave BCN yeah. very high ratings. And Dwayne said, but they only gave my fellow disc jockeys a four and, and they gave me a 13. And I'm looking out the window of the Prudential here and I see there's 13 people outside plus four people on hold in the phone. So they lied. So what you got to do is you got to send a bag of of feces to, to and, and I gave the, I mean, Dwayne gave the exact address of, of Arbitron Research Bureau in Beltsville, Maryland. So gave them the, uh, and every 15 minutes when the break would come, Dwayne would go, don't forget all these guys down there, you got to send them a bag of excrement, make sure that you put it in a plastic bag so that the male people don't, you know, and, and, uh, and he kept doing that for the entire show. I'm sorry, would and, you say that again? I couldn't hear what you said. <laughs> this is the <laughs> opinion, I'm sorry. And, and anyway, so that show, Dwayne did. And then Monday morning, Clee Dobra, who's the manager of WBCM, comes to my show, Charles Lacadera. And he says, Charles, I want to see you after your show. Please come to my office. And I went into his office after my show. And I sat down. And Clee's, uh, this white guy uh, with the didn't wear socks. He had uh, the, the shoes that you wear when you own a boat, a yacht, and you just have those decks. And he's sitting there, you know, with his shirt opened up and he's stirring a cup of Dunkin' Donuts coffee with his finger, a large cup of black coffee. He's so upset. He's stirring it with his finger and he's looking at me and the veins in his neck are going out. And he's saying, Dwayne, he said, Charles Laquadera is the consummate professional radio announcer. Charles Laquadera has been great for my radio station, but Dwayne Glasscock, and then he started swearing all these experts <laughs> is of this and that, and Dwayne Glasscock is fired. He's never to be on this station again. Do you understand? And I said, Clay, how could you do that? Dwayne's got like a 13 rating. He's just like, he, and he looked at me and he said, with well, his stirring his coffee, are you playing with a full deck? You're acting like Dwayne and you are two different people. <laughs> and I said, well, you just fired him and you kept me. Anyway, Dwayne get it, was off the air for a couple of weeks. And then the manager, the owner rather, came in and, and put Dwayne back on because, you know, money talks and nobody wants and all that stuff. I and uh, it looks like we are out of time. Um, so I want to thank everybody for tuning in and joining us for this. This is our actual our second installment of 
of BCN and the American Revolution. We did one, as I said earlier, last year. Uh, and again, upwards of 700 people tuning in today. We want to thank you uh, for your support of GBH. We want to thank you for being around uh, WBCN for as long as you were. And, uh, you know, it's a station, as Charles said earlier, it's not going to happen again. Um, you know, we were all lucky enough to experience it. Uh, I got my first paycheck in radio from Oedipus. I got the ple had the pleasure of working with Charles and, you know, and look at me now. I'm a news guy at GBH. So they, they something worked. Something came out okay. Uh, I am going to hand it over now to back to uh, Ron Bachman, and he's going to close out uh, uh, with uh, some closing remarks. And I will see everybody on the radio tomorrow at 5 a.m., 89.7 WGBH. Hey. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Debbie, Henry. thanks so much. Eric, I'll see you in the office. Charles, <laughs> I'll see you wherever. Aloha. And, and, and Bill, I'll, I'll, I'll see you at some point as well. Thanks, Henry. We Thank are you. back out of time. So it falls to me, I guess, to be the buzzkill and cut this off. But um, we want to thank you so much for joining us as we presented these behind the scenes stories to give you a glimpse at what transpired at BCN in that time in the late 60s and early 70s. Thanks, Bill Lichtenstein, for making an amazing film. Thanks also to Charles, Eric, and Debbie for joining us this evening. And of course, to Henry Santoro for moderating this, a fascinating conversation that could have continued. That was a really fast hour. Thank you all for your contributions. Now, mark your calendars. Uh, and this information is in the chat if you want to look for it there too. But um, we will be airing WBCN and the American Revolution several times in prime time in the coming week, week and a half starting next Thursday, the 11th, at nine o'clock on GBH2, then two days later on GBH44, Saturday at eight, and then the following Friday, November 19th, at eight o'clock on GBH World. So if you haven't seen this film, as others have said, I urge you to take a look at it. It's really wonderful. I was not living in Boston at the time that uh, this was going on, but I found it fascinating nonetheless. So for those of you tuning in from locations outside of the Boston broadcast area, this film is in distribution to public TV stations across the country. So, you know, be sure to check your local PBS affiliate to see if they're running it and when. As always, please visit our events page at wgbh.org slash events to learn more about upcoming events like this one. And thank you all again. Have a wonderful night.